Uh, yeah, my name is Gareth Ford Williams. I, uh, we're, we're not the biggest broadcaster in the world, the biggest public service broadcaster in the world. I think there'll be a lot of Americans who'd be very upset <laughs> if we try and lay claim to that one. Um, we uh, yeah, have uh, over 20,000 people working for us, uh, and I work in one division of this. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about BT first, just to kind of frame what we do, uh, and then a little bit about what we've kind of learned over the last 10 years, because I think we've been, we've been dealing with this problem for quite a while now. Um, and uh, I think that a lot of the, the issues uh, that Leon's already articulated, we've already kind of either been through or are going through ourselves, and I hope there's a fair enough synergy with what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so, yeah, BBC, uh, eight TV channels, uh, 50 radio stations, iPlayer, I think the biggest news gathering service could be in the world, I'm not quite sure about that, but it's huge. Uh, world service, so we, we create content in 32 different languages around the world. It's a big organisation and there's a lot of content, a lot of complexity. We're governed by an independent organisation from the BBC called BBC Trust. Uh, they are our police. We do things, we have a charter, and if we do things that fall outside of that charter or do things around fair trading issues, they come down and it's like a ton of bricks. So they police our policy, they define our policy. We have BBC values. These are great things. These are on the back of everyone's pass, and I carry these with me. And, and these frame as an individual in the BBC what you do on a day to day basis. So I'll just read them out. Uh, so trust is the foundation of the BBC. We are independent, impartial, and honest. I'm going to read up and bucket this actually. So audiences are at the heart of everything we do. That's very, very key to mark on my role. We take pride in delivering quality and value for money. Creativity, which again, I think is a very, very important one for me. Creativity is the lifeblood of our organisation. We respect each other and celebrate our diversity so everyone can give their best. Again, really important for me. And we are one BBC, great things happen when we work together. And they do continuously, as an organisation, push departments, divisions to share and work together. That an organisation of that size, it's very easy for everything to become siloed. So it's trying to get rid of those silos and actually do collaborative work. This is the guy that runs it, Tony Hall, uh, or I should say Lord Tony Hall. Uh, he's been with us for a couple of years now, um, and he's said something in his first speech to the staff, which absolutely, well, every single time a DG asks you, they say something very similar, but this is really great. He said, at the core of the BBC's role is something very simple, very democratic, and very important to bring the best to everyone, wherever you are, whoever you are, whether you're rich or poor, old or young, that's what we do. Everybody deserves the best. And this is what we hang a lot of this accessibility work on. It is about delivering the content to everybody because everyone pays their taxes and pays the licences. Uh, these things are formalised as well in strategies that are delivered by the exec board. So we have a diversity strategy. Tony Hall is the person who's responsible for the delivery of that on an organisational level. And there are five things in that, and this is one of them. Build in accessibility from the start when developing new products and services and ensure sustainable and ongoing accessibility. Now that's products, that's buildings, that's you know, broadcast environments and production environments. That's anything we do. We have to, you have to plan from day one before anything is built or even commissioned or procured. So, me, I work in this division, BBC Future Media. It's quite a small division. Uh, it's only got a couple of thousand people working in it, uh, about 400 developers, 120 designers, lots and lots of people in it, but it is a small division. We are very, very small compared with, with the content divisions and radio, etc. Um, we deliver one product, one service, sorry, one service which is BBC Online. Uh, this is defined by anything that is delivered via internet protocol or anything that's delivered by a, a digital terrestrial TV that is not linear broadcast, so we have interactive DTT services. Within that we have 10 products, uh, eight of which are kind of uh, uh, content based, even though we don't actually own the content, the content divisions give us the content, we produce the products that deliver the content. So news, um, sport, weather, CBBC and CBBS, which are our children's products, CBBS is for the under sixes, CBBC for the six to twelve year olds. KNL, uh, which everyone asks me what the hell does that mean? It's knowledge and learning. Um, this is absolutely enormous. It's all our factual content, educational content, etc. Uh, TV, of course, uh, radio, 
uh, home and search, which are kind of there's a there's a big load of work around there. I mean, we we have a, a BBC homepage, which is a product in its own right, um, which was kind of like a portal onto the BBC, and to understand the breadth of the BBC and search to actually how you go about finding the, the content. We deliver across four screens. TV, tablet, mobile, uh, and, and, and via PC, of course. And that's scale. Uh, so there's over, I'm not sure exactly the number is now, I think they've been closing some down, over 150 top level domains. Uh, BBC Online, 61.1 million unique bro, uh, browsers per pound a month. Uh, BBC iPlayer, 25 million programs watched per day. Um, it's, and this is all UK only. BBC iPlayer available on a thousand, it's over a thousand two hundred now. Devices I got at some figures last night. Um, knowledge and learning, we recently pulled all the content into this single product, all of the factual stuff. We found out we had over a million pages, static pages of content in there. Uh, BBC News, we published in 32 different languages, thousands of pages every single day. Um, and BBC Red Button Service, uh, over, which is our interactive TV service, 17.5 million unique users per week in the UK. It's bigger than BBC.co.uk. People often forget that .co.uk is, is smaller. Red button. Um, as an organisation, we've always been about getting our users to get the best out of BBC services. So even back in 1952, we put up test services on TVs to help people adjust their TV sets to get the best out of them. And this appeared in the magazine, Radio Times. Uh, I've been digging back to try and find more and more examples of this, but I find it quite interesting. Um, but with that in mind, we, we had to we kind of work, I suppose, with uh, our, our users, with our license fee payers, to kind of deliver the best service we can. And we, and, and this is kind of actually when I met, yeah, um, this was kind of the, the question that we, we discussed. Uh, well, actually, I talked at him for two and a half hours, bless him. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he was quite, quite prepared for that. Um, but we, we kind of have some various different things where we frame the delivery of accessibility. And these are 10 things that I'm going to try and run through and give you some examples now. There's more than this, but I think these are very important. So I'll run through the list of what I'm going to talk about. So ownership is very key. Uh, I put this as number one. If you don't deal with ownership of accessibility in an organization and decide where it sits, the rest of it is just going to end up as friction and, and huge amounts of money spent and, and compromise and all sorts of horrible stuff happens after the, if this is not fixed. Um, it's not all about standards or guidelines, it's a framework. Like standards are often pulled up as the thing that accessibility is about. I think they're a brilliant tool. Um, I'm a big fan of WCAG, however we don't use WCAG. <laughs> I'll get to that. Um, the things this framework includes skills, uh, and it also includes processes. Um, there's loads of counterproductive stuff that people do around accessibility. Uh, and I think Leon <coughs> actually already mentioned a few things. And I think there's stuff, it's all about, it's, it's how you deliver accessibility as much as what accessibility is uh, that makes it uh, successful or not. Uh, accessibility starts with design. It's not about developers necessarily. Developers have a tendency of doing an amazing job of pulling us out of the mud, um, but they shouldn't have to. Um, if we get the designs right, we get the product design right, then that should not be happening. Um, we look for points of convergence in our business plans. So if we have an objective to fix something and we know something that we want to deliver it is, but there are low technical dependencies, we, look at, we ask questions, when are these going to be refreshed? When are those contracts going to be renewed? Can we add new stuff into the renewal of that contract, or can we change it now within the terms of that contract? Can we make sure all of these uh, product teams talk to each other so they come to a point to fix the problem that we need fixing? We continuously improve pro uh, products as well, and I think this is again one of those. It's kind of a, a, a lot of people talk about this. You know, when we build stuff, it's not about auditing at the end. But I'm going to come come to that in a bit. Um, and we listen and learn from feedback. One of the most important things is our users. Um, and if you don't listen to your users, you don't learn about your users. Um, and we support and evolve this framework, which is where I come in. Uh, that's my job at the end. Um, so ownership. In the BBC, accessibility is arguably owned by six people, or six groups of people, and none of them are me. Uh, <laughs> It's all responsibility to these people. 
So up here, here's Anne. She's our chief financial officer. She sits on the exec board, um, controls probably close to four billion pounds worth of money. Um, and she's also the exec champion for accessibility. She has to balance investment in accessibility with, um, and the cost of it financially with the public value it delivers. And she can make those calls because she controls all the money. It's not it is by design, not by coincidence, that the CFO actually holds that position in, in, in the exec board. Director of strategy is James. So James owns the planning around all of our new products and our new ideas and our new, new, uh, new services that we're going to deliver. And he makes sure that accessibility is built into those plans. He also owns the discussion, the trust, he owns the discussion around this with the government. He owns the discussion around this with the lobby groups. So all of that happens in one place. Ralph at the end, he's the director of my division. Uh, he owns the delivery of it. So the general managers. Get on to it. So it's about Ralph's head of future media. So general managers, they make up the board of future media. Now these guys, um, my boss sits in amongst those. Julia, who's the head, who's the general manager of, uh, of UX and D, user experience design. Um, they actually are my business case sponsors. They're the people that all give up money out of all their products to pay for the accessibility team to support the framework that supports their products. Brief. Um, and then there's the product managers that work for them, so they tell the product managers to implement this framework, and then the product managers tell us what's wrong with the framework, and then we build the framework to be, you know, work with the product managers, and then this great bunch of people at the end, they don't actually own any responsibility at all, but they, apart from, they own the voice of accessibility to the products. We have a champions network. So we manage and support that champions network, and they can be anyone in the organisation, they can be they can be the product manager themselves, they can be a developer, they can be a designer, QA, engineer, anyone who actually sits there when they're doing sprints and say, how do we build this accessible? accessible. You know, they, they constantly are the voice, the nagging voice, and you need it sometimes. Uh, and they become the go-to person, we support them, they come to us with the big questions, but we make sure that all of the, the support, whether it's you know, within the framework, whether it's training, whether it's, it's tools, whatever, is, is available to that team. So it's not all about standards and guidelines, it's a framework. Uh, so we have standards. Um, and these aren't WCAG standards, but they actually, a lot of it in there is derived from WCAG. And WCAG is an, an amazing resource, um, but for us, as a broadcaster, it's too agnostic and too open to interpretation. So we, and we also have a slightly different interpretation of the word standards. So with WCAG, a lot of it is this, this, quite subjective as to whether you've delivered it successfully or not. But when we say standard, and it's something that you kind of achieve, you, you, you try and strive for, with us, standards are stuff that you don't fall below. It's at the bottom. So this stuff is the, there is no exemption stuff. There's 32 of them. Uh, every single one has a techniques library behind it, so you can see how it's done. And we've also developed a QA framework. So there's automated and manual tests that QA teams can implement to find out whether they've done it correctly. And you don't need an accessibility expert to tell you when you've done it correctly, the test will tell you. Then, if you try to do it and the test is all that doesn't work properly, or you think you found something new, you come to us, we evolve the standards because you may have found an edge case where you've not considered. And so it becomes this kind of organic process, but this is the stuff that is manual. So, standards for us, they must be objective, they must be legal, and there are legal issues with some of the we had when it comes to broadcasts, uh, particularly around rights, um, and that's a, that's a whole other hour of discussion. Um, but they have to be meaningful, uh, they have to be scalable, uh, they have to be demonstrable, so you have to be able to show how to do them, how it has to be answered, and it has, anyone should be able to understand that how, and they have to be testable. Guidelines we do have on the other hand, but these are things that are learnable, these are about skills and best practices, these are stuff that we then train and encourage people to do because this is actually, as a developer, how you become a better developer. Um, they also then look at legal issues. They have to be meaningful, scalable, and demonstrable. But they're not mandate. Although you'd think they were sometimes. But the way we talk about them, we still treat these as things that are not optional. They're the way that we do stuff. Um, and then we break it down even further. So here's our, our a screenshot from our um, mobile accessibility web app. Uh, we actually decided to put all our standards and guidelines for mobile 
in an app built using the techniques in its own guidelines. So uh, it's a phrase in, 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 in English that it eats its own dog food. Um, so it, you can actually see it working. So we actually have guidelines for, for designers, we have guidelines for developers, we have guidelines for editors, and we have resources. So if I am an editor, I go there, I want to know what, what, what I need to do around accessibility. I don't have to bother with all the stuff that the developers need. Uh, and behind the guidelines is where we have resources. So for instance, for an editor, uh, we have uh, labeling conventions for absolutely everything that we do across all of the products. And you can go there and you can find out about you know, how you label in a copy. Uh, and you can look at the design patterns and look at the labeling conventions so that we have consistency, editorial consistency. That play button always says play. You'd be surprised how many times it says something else. <laughs> um, skills. I think I've already touched on this. We have we, we turn a lot of this stuff into online training courses, stuff where you can spend a couple of ideas, uh, hours being trained in how to develop, how to use the techniques that sit behind the, the, the standards. And by the way, we're training the techniques, not necessarily in the standards or why we develop the standards. I think we should work for the BBC if you don't understand why we're doing this. Um, so the whole thing is about techniques and, and developing this skill set. Now the funny thing is actually roughly the cost of doing each one of the course, these courses is the same cost of doing one audit on a product. Um, and to me, value, we, we turn around, you know, we make the case that this is huge value for the organisation is building skill. Processes are the other thing. Um, this on screen is the shape, build, run process which we use to develop every single product. Every product manager is trained in this. Um, and I've made some notes because I'm going to get this wrong, I should know this. <laughs> but we have certain activities that happen in certain places. So, I'm going to try and simplify it down, but, but basically what, what happens is, you know, in the shape things, we have concepts and ideas, feasibilities, opportunities, definition and discovery. But in this it goes everything from the research and development around accessibility, what R&D do we need to do, what challenges does this present that we've never seen before, through to the requirements. And so accessibility is being dealt with at that point and planning. Even at the end of that, we're planning, okay, what kind of use of research needs to happen uh, in the design process of this we're able to design it accessibly. So there's tons of questions that are already being answered. I'm going to catch this to my face. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get some reading. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then, in the build phase, this is all about standards, guidelines, you know, building feature sets. So, you know, um, so it's kind of release, iterate. Yeah, everyone should be familiar with this kind of thing. And then when it goes to run, there's still accessibility activity happens there because that's when you evaluate and you learn. What did we do well? What did we do not so well? So when we go all the way back again, we make sure, and we, we make sure of this, it's never any less accessible than last time, and we build on everything that we learned from doing it wrong last time, the, the previous time. And this iteration process happens with every single product, it all goes through cycles. And the thing just naturally gets better and better and better. Counterproductive stuff that can happen. We cannot afford it. How many, how many people have heard that phrase when you just said, can we build this accessibly? One, fantastic, two, three, four, yeah. <laughs> I was quite terrified when one went up. <laughs> there goes the presentation through. Uh, so we cannot afford it. I, that every single time you hear that, ask for a breakdown of the costs. Um, nine times out of ten, they haven't got one. They've just heard that it's scary and expensive, and they don't actually know how much it costs. And the other time is when they do present the costs, they're completely crazy. Some of the activities that they think they need to do, they don't need to do it. And you can help them build a budget around doing that within a product. Uh, to me, this phrase does not exist. It also does not exist because there are business cases around this and the fact that it is public value. In an organisation like the BBC, this should never be said. Isn't that something developers do? Um, uh, and, and this is again one of those myths. It's not. It's about everybody in the product. Um, and again, you know, it's, it, it, sometimes this is just one of those things. It's people who join the organisation, they've never done this before, um, and they come with some preconceived ideas and we have to get around them. And the last thing is, is, is actually, <laughs> this is more of an organisational issue, and actually I was quite pleased that Leon pulled on this, is trying and failing is not the same as not caring. 
Now, often you get issues with the way how people do stuff. So counterproductive activities, we don't do accessibility audits. Um, an audit is already an admission that you've not planned for it and you've failed. Um, and, and you're going to go and retrofit, which is going to cost a fortune. And then everyone's going to say accessibility is expensive. Um, and, and it is. If you're doing that at the end of the process, it's broken. It's gone. The other thing is someone to, I think it's every really twice a year, if someone goes around and goes, brilliant, we planned an accessibility sprint. And we sprint from, no! <laughs> every sprint is an accessibility sprint. Um, you should always be, how do we build it, how do we build it accessible? Not how do we build it, forget about it for a few weeks and then try and fix it. Um, so that doesn't work. And again, it becomes expensive. Um, testing anything with assistive technology uses that are not, a, we're not 100% sure meets the standards. So sticking someone with an AT, a user, in front of it, and we are pretty sure, or we're not sure whether actually it and the technology are going to work, we can't actually then understand whether the last point is whether it's usable. And accessibility and usability is something we are very, very clear in our organization we separate. So HCI with an assistive technology user is the same as HCI and the same consideration as someone without. It's just about people interfacing with our products and services. The fact they use an assistive technology is neither here nor there. They need to be able to use it. It's not just about ticking boxes and saying we've, we've done the accessibility of the tech. And we start with design. So we have all kind of four principles around um, accessibility and design. We have choice, uh, so choice of how to discover it, choice of how to interact with it, choice of which formats to live it in. Uh, we give users control. So yeah, we actually have had someone before breaking pitch zoom, and they said, "Oh yeah, when you zoom into it, it looks shit." And it's like we don't care the content. You know, the the, hey, the, 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 the images didn't zoom properly. But that doesn't matter. The content is what someone needs to get to. We'll fix the image problem at a later date. You've got, you can't do that. You've got to get people out of control of this. Uh, and the same with control, whether a page updates or not. You know, you've got to, updating pages is something that sometimes you need to do automatically, not refreshing the whole page, but an element within it. But allow people to control how that happens. Uh, we've got to be consistent across all our products. So familiar pattern standard controls. We have one media player and one media player UX. Uh, I will openly admit that there was a few years ago we had 168 different user experience media players. <laughs> uh, I, I actually think we need an award for how many times you can do the same project. Uh, and we shut them all down and built new ones. And, and built accessibility into that product. Uh, that product team are actually exemplary in the way that they deal with accessibility. And then every product benefits because they all implement it. Um, and you add value. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that, which was the last one. But again, you know, in, in um, we look at feature layer accessibility and things like iPlayer. So even down to the point where, um, okay, we have loads of audio described content, and loads of BSL, which is sign, British Sign Language content in there. It's buried, uh, so we give them their own categories. So you can get a top level category and go straight to the content you're after. Um, so the Chromecast example is quite an interesting one. So we work very closely with Google on this. So when Google, when Chromecast launched earlier this year in the UK, they wanted to launch with iPlayer ready to install. Um, uh, we said, yeah, it must have subtitles. So we worked with Google and got subtitles working on Chromecast. Um, and then because our app is, is so accessible, Chromecast becomes accessible. And so you can get into, you can launch off Chromecast, you can launch all of iPlayer's content onto your television with the access services intact. And so suddenly VOD on TV becomes more accessible than it is on most, most TV platforms, which is great. Um, another thing, I mean, there's loads of bits in UX, you know, even down this, I, I actually need this, I'm probably not supposed to have this up, but it's, uh, we, we're doing personas at the minute in sport, uh, I, I, I wrote this one up, and every single, every single product in terms of personas, but even down to the point that we pointed out this one person here uses subtitles, because sometimes he did, he, he, particularly crowd noise. Um, it's something that he really, really struggles with, and, and so that's a, you know. And I think they've got six personas, and four of them have some form of impairment, and they're all different and different requirements. And, and just no one asks them to do this, but this is what their team just naturally do because that actually naturally reflects our audience and the challenges our audience face. And we also train uh, our designers, so they annotate accessibility. So one of the big problems we found is when designers design things, and they make a thought of accessibility and design, if they've not 
um, documented it properly, then it may be interpreted incorrectly, and then you end up with something broken. So even down to you know uh, training in, in, in accessibility techniques for designers, as well as things like annotation, are really important. And then while well, we've already talked about the standard media player, we have uh, Bixi Gel, which is global experience language. We have libraries. <laughs> and libraries are another great resource for accessibility, so we make sure that every single design pattern in the library has thought about accessibility. And behind global experience language, we also have code libraries which support the global experience. This one's TAL, our TV application layer, which is an open source project. So there's loads of links, by the way, in all of this. So hopefully most of it is accessible outside the UK, but apologies if it's not. Um, but I know this one is. So this is the uh, framework we build all our TV applications on, um, and accessibility is built into that. So c convergence is something that I, I think is really, really important. Um, this is kind of an excuse, I think, around people are trying to deliver this, so, but we are often working in a framework of other people's technologies and pre-existing -pre uh, production tools and workflows. Um, that is a massive problem. Um, you know, how, where is your responsibility on delivering this? You know, as a, as a service provider, we want to be accessible, but if the browser <coughs> manufacturers, the operating system guys, and the AT guys have not properly talked together and complied to the same standards, you're going to end up with a broken experience. Um, and so where is our responsibility in that? We do what we can, but sometimes it is out of our control if the platform is fundamentally broken from an accessibility perspective. Uh, how can you affect these and what benefits can we gain when these things are redesigned and re-procured. Um, convergence is, I think it's point I made quite earlier, is, is something that, and as a good, good example of this, is something that we considered around our subtitle delivery on iPlayer. So since 2010, subtitle support is mandated for pre-installed and supported iPlayer apps. So there are 1,200 devices in the UK, most of them come pre-installed. We, we count PC and uh, Mac one device each. Um, and the, so these are TVs and, and, and uh, gaming platforms, uh, Blu-ray players, all sorts of stuff. And, and we just said, right, okay, you can have it, but subtitles are supported on that platform. You have to do that. And, that's, uh, and that's, that, that was the accessibility requirement. It means that since, you know, since 2010, we haven't had a single product on the UK market without subtitle support uh, from manufacturers. Um, but we knew to do this meaningfully, that's nice. But to do it meaningfully, we needed a single format of subtitles. We needed to deliver an automated back end for delivering those subtitles. We needed to build a single media player product, which we've already touched on. Um, and we contract our subtitle production, so we had to make sure that the workflows matched what we wanted to do with our back end and with the product. And so the way we did this as a start off with is the guy, he's not me, uh, Michael Nigel Medic, who works for the BBC, and his full time job is to chair these, uh, the uh, uh, time text markup language groups um, and also deliver stuff for BBC and around TTML for the uh, European Broadcasting Union, the W3C. It's to converge these two standards groups because manufacturers were going in two different directions following two different standards groups, which was going to make a nightmare for us to support. We, at the same time, he works with uh, Marina and Henry, who have delivered Video Factory, which is our entire backend. So the standards and the workflows are all pulled together. Um, the, the, the silence from the crowd, actually, this is probably the Doctor Who is saying, sorry, stop listening a while ago. Okay. Um, this is our standard media player, so that has to converge with support for those standards. <coughs> this is a horrible big workflow document, but it shows that when it comes through broadcast, it comes into Video Factory and all the right formats are supported. So we, we, we're even designing our workflows around this. And then suddenly our output is brilliant. 100% of all live player content is subtitled. All devices that can deliver it, which is I think over 96% now uh, of the devices that iPlayer is on. You have subtitles on them and we have be able to do streams, promos, downloads, live content. Uh, and we also have a program, um, uh, a research program now looking at the, the challenges around clips. Um, but this is all possible because of convergence. Um, a few little bits on subtitles, by the way, because it's always an interesting discussion around subtitles. But 
with a return path, we can ac accurately monitor subtitle usage. Whenever you get, get stats around subtitles, I'm always interested to know where the hell they've got those numbers from, because we, we, we don't know. It's usually a very, very small set of people, a few thousand. We, I'm, I'm always curious around that. But with the return path, it's been quite interesting. So over 5%, that's 500,000 programs viewed on iPlayer every day with subtitles switched on. Now, if that isn't a reason to do it, I don't know what is. That's, that's a hell of a reach. Um, uh, you know, the highest figure is 8% on tablets. So it's quite interesting to say that actually tablets are, are reaching an older audience <laughs> and our subtitle consumption is going up on those platforms. <laughs> oh, it should really be surprising, should it? <laughs> um, cost of subtitle delivery, blog content and, uh, and, and clips is becoming negligible because we've done all of that work in convergence, which is taken a while and there was a bit of pain in the middle, but it, you know, it's worth it. Uh, and as I point out there, yeah, subtitles are not going to be there worthwhile. Um, and then we have the other challenges, then, then, then it's great, then our, our, our lobby groups and our users go, fantastic, great, what about clips? And, uh, and so we are now trying to tackle that, so we're trying to understand clips are a nightmare, I could do two hours on clips, I'm telling you, you poor guys, you run away. Um, they are such a complicated thing to do, but dealing with each of the different types of content on it, each need a lot of consideration, and we're doing the same kind of exercise for those, whether we're generating our own content on clips, whether it's clips taken from broadcast content, tips taken from live broadcast content, clips made of multiple clips from multiple bits of live broadcast content, user-generated clips, all sorts of different stuff, and there's loads of production workflows and issues. Um, and, and so this is something, again, we're, we're tackling. Um, and then continuously improved products. Uh, continuous improvement is something that I, I totally believe in. I've already talked about that in the shape of one run process, but one big, big, big example of this is a thing called uh, UView. Uh, uh, site says UView, but it's something else that's on point. So in 2008, um, I sat down with a guy who's actually now chairman of the RNIB, Royal National Institute of Blind. Uh, he worked for me at the time. He's done another well for himself. <laughs> it's like, um, so it's, uh, we had lunch one day and I asked him about television. He's been blind from birth, Kevin Perry. Brilliant guy. And I said, how, how can you use TV? He said, well, no. It's great in the old days, it's television, you put the buttons stuck in and out, only four channels was great, some of it wasn't audio described, so drama and, and natural history was a bit hard to, to, to get around, but the rest of it I could get to. And then someone went and stuck an EPG, an electronic program guide, and a, and a remote control in the way, with loads of buttons on it, and I can't even find it. He said, don't make it whistle when I clap my hands, everything whistles when I clap my hands. Um, and, and so we realised that suddenly, we, although we were delivering audio description, um, at the same time, the industry had destroyed the, the, the whole discovery of it. So we were giving people content we couldn't get. Um, and so we, we suddenly saw that there was a, 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 you know, a big, big, big problem here. Um, no standards around delivering against that. But IPTV and, and, Stra and, and our uh, strategy uh, team were looking at IPTV very closely and it presented an opportunity. You view was that opportunity. Um, by the way, you you launched in 2012, I think it's got over a million homes, I think, in the UK having a good box. BBC R&D built it, in my lovely big man picture of the BBC R&D logo, which I didn't realise. Um, uh, so we had control over it, um, but we also had, it was part of the joint venture partnership, and though we were building it, we had British Telecom Channel 4, Talk Talk, ITV, the, the big broadcasters, uh, distribution networks were our, our partners in delivering this. Uh, this is one of the boxes. Um, think great thing about UView is we we set ourselves out certain challenges. So we had to fix these problems, but we also had to deliver a viable product. Um, one of the things we were allowed to do was basically write a set of requirements, which was more my job at the time, um, but not had a penny to the price of the box, um, which was fun. Uh, <laughs> so we did a lot. Um, everything through from the EPG, which is both high vis um, and it's also dyslexic and, uh, and, and autistic spectrum disorder friendly. Um, so we pick colours, even the font uh, has humanistic letter shapes and their repetition is designed by uh, Fontsmith and Mencap, uh, which is a charity in the UK. Uh, brilliant, it's called FSME, fantastic fonts. We pick the font, the colours, the way it works. You can even switch off, if you find movement, high movement disturbing, you can switch off loads of the animations and stuff like that, put the low movement mode. 
There's a super high vis mode, um, which is stent, again, for people with vision impairment. Uh, we even have a magnifier built into it with a dedicated button on the remote control. You can even drive it with a single switch. There's a single switch way of doing it through Grid2 software. We work with Scope, who are another charity, We've built this thing, and it's fantastic. So, you know, I don't think there's another TV platform in the world that can be driven with a single switch. You can plug in alternate control devices like BIT keyboards, and they remapped all of the remote control, core remote control functionality to those keyboards. So suddenly that little thing with fiddly little buttons is, is too much for you. You can use a controller that's much better. Um, I don't know, we were certainly not the first organisation to look at second screen accessibility, but we started looking at it in about 2008. Um, and, and the big R&D project we did off the back of it, the Universal Control API, which we built on the MIF TV <coughs> platform, which allows full control, remote control, EPG and everything from your iPhone. Your, your device that actually you know has all of your AT already built in, and you don't have to rely on the, the, on the, the platform anymore. And that's uh, they've now started to implement that on their own apps. Is that 10 minutes? Right? <laughs> Oh, I've got through this much quicker than I thought. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so the thing is with this, the continuous improvement is that. We delivered loads of stuff at one, but we set this little rule um, that we knew that the ambition was much big, was, was very, very big. But we agreed that all features and groundwork that cannot be retrofitted had to be mandated in version one, and then we build on top of those. And I think it's something that we've kind of seen happen with organisations with Apple with their products. I mean, no one really talks about how accessible iPhone 1, 2, and 3 is, but really if it wasn't for iPhone 1, 2, and 3, it wasn't an accessible iPhone 4. They just iterated, learned, changed, you know, and evaluated what they did and just built a better and better and better product. But I believe, I don't know, I'm never inside Apple, but I can't see that they weren't thinking about it before iPhone 1. You know, it's, it's too good a framework. Um, and then every time you rebuild, ensure it's no less accessible than the previous version. It's that same as. Last couple of points. Uh, I like complaints. Uh, uh, the, the British are the worst at not complaining. They go off and they mumble and they talk to rubbish on the page. And then you go to them and say, what was it like? Oh, it was marvellous! Fabulous! Yeah. Uh, there's no use for me. I like complaints and I like detail. It was broken, I used this. This is how it broke. This is when it broke. Yeah, the more data we get back, the more we can look into stuff and we see patterns. And then we see that actually we're doing something wrong and then we can change behaviours. And so that relationship with your users is incredibly important and encouraging. Um, and last, this is the slide about me. <laughs> so this is finally where I am. It's support and evolve, uh, and evolve the framework. We have, as a, an organisation, as, as a division of over 2,000 people, um, plus loads of suppliers and, and freelancers and all sorts of things, we have four accessibility specialists supporting it. And that's because it's a framework, and that's because it works as an organisation. So to me, I look at things like policy and strategy, TV platforms, and access service delivery. Penny, who unfortunately has recently left our team, um, and just wants to do marvellous things. Absolutely amazing, Penny Swan, on mobile tablet platforms. Um, she also works with on bot services on iPlayer, uh, and she uh, delivered a lot of training. Ian Pouncey, um, who uh, I, I'm actually totally in awe of these three people. I think if you've ever got a team of people who work for you, you should be in awe of them. So Ian County has developed all of the web standards, the QA framework, the techniques library behind that. He's worked with a large group of people. If you do it with the organisation, you don't just sit off in the form and screw all do this stuff. Um, code base general, which is the global experience language um, that I showed earlier. We're now looking at building a whole uh, a code library behind every single pattern within there. So it's, uh, it's really embedded in that. Um, and the QA framework, which we deliver behind the standards. And Jamie Knight, uh, he manages our champions network, so he deals, we actually have you know, uh, a management system behind it, Jira, and you know, tickets come in, and we look at them every single week. Uh, we max them all up, we get conversations going, we fix problems. Um, and he also delivers techniques um, and, and does a lot of stuff on our on monitoring. And really, we don't need any more people than that. We can cover that many services in that size organisation with, with a team of four people. Uh, and, and a fairly modest budget. Um, 
you know, like, out comes the BBC, BBC I play it. It, it is the industry, I, I, we are quite proud, we will say it's the industry, uh, industry benchmark of our accessibility, and, and we get used by the UK government to, you know, and go, well, why is it happening over there to other big, you know, to other uh, broadcasters? Uh, and then we work with the government bodies, and actually so we say, well, this is how we did it, and here's our code. Uh, and we give stuff away to try and help the industry catch up, you know, we've luckily had all this public service money to be able to invest in this stuff, but then we should then give away to just make things better. Uh, develop the time reducing from approximately 20% to 5% on accessibility. We did an audit at one point on the amount of time that was being spent retrofitting code because we were doing evaluations at the end and then refitting. It's massively expensive. 20% of 400 developers' time is, well, I don't even want to know what the figure is. It's, it's mental. It should be under 5% we spent on it on features, and they should just do the rest as part of their job. Um, and the same with designers. Uh, staff leave the BBC and take these skills with them. And so we have like a network of people we have now in other media organisations who come through us. We've trained them, they've left, they've improved the organisation they've gone to, and sometimes they come back and bring ideas with them. And then it helps <laughs> us build this. Um, and, and we regularly keep in contact with them. Um, so the media industry in the UK becomes more accessible, and we say we can do that part of it. Uh, we've got to play our part, and the BBC stays true to its core values. Um, so my recommendations, things for you guys to think about, is, is if you haven't got an ownership model, is start talking about it. it. Literally, if you don't have an ownership model in an organisation, it, it's going to be hard work. Um, <coughs> you need to think about this as a framework. So I, I love W3C's work. I think actually if you look at each standard or guideline, and there's a separation there, um, there's a lot of thought and a lot of brilliant people behind them, but you need to work, understand how you're going to evaluate them and, and implement them and use them. Um, skills are hugely important. You know, it shouldn't be just about, it shouldn't be a dark art, accessibility, it should be something that's natural. Um, processes and champions are also really, really, really important. I'm not saying our model should work for anyone else, because this has been very just for us, but start thinking about these things in the context of your own work. Uh, support that framework. Um, and don't do it on a job-by-job -job basis, because you'll we, we'll just start from scratch every single time. Uh, look for points of convergence, continuously improve your products and collaborate. Um, it's a bit cheesy to say this, but the thing is, I bet you all the right people are in this room to fix all the problems. Um, and, and, you know, and I, we get it in, in the UK sometimes as people get together, but we get together once twice a year and have a bit of a chat and then speak again. Uh, and come back and share stuff. I mean, we should have kept those conversations going and shared and collaborated. And so, thank you. That was me. I'm very sorry if it was very quick. <laughs> Any questions? And I hopefully I'll.